think you could also make that if you work at a desk or something, bring your Bible to work day, okay? So if, uh, you know, if you're an electrician, it's going to be a little hard, but take a New Testament with you, you know? If you, that's why we have the little New Testaments, take them with you. Uh, yeah, I see an electrician back there shaking his head, you know? Uh, there you go. But if you got a, but if you got a, um, uh, you know, if you work at a desk or someplace, put it there on top of your desk, you know, and just let it sit there. Why not just October 4th? Why not every day of the year? Uh, absolutely. Very good. And so people ask you about it, so that's, that's a terrific thing. Um, I, I, I think I think college is considered school, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. So I'd say it's college, sure, yes. All works, I would. Yeah, I mean, I went to a Christian college, so, it was a, so I carried my Bible every single day to every single class, you know. But uh, yeah, I think that's great. I think for uh, for all schools, I think if you're at a secular school, with your public, if you're a public school, and, you know, or if you're at a college or any place at all, and even at work, I encourage you to do that. So we're on First Timothy chapter uh, two today, and in chapter two, he wants to deal about worship. Now remember, he left he left um, uh, Timothy behind at Ephesus because there were some problems. And uh, he wanted him to straight things out. Tim, uh, Paul went on to do other work and left Timothy there. And so chapter 2 talks about some of the issues that I think they were having in there. And then in chapter 3, he talks about the leadership of the church. To make sure you get good quality leaders. You need quality leaders. And a lot of churches fail because they don't have quality leaders. So in chapter 3, we'll talk about leadership. In chapter 2, he's going to talk about some of the issues that they had probably at Ephesus and uh, how we have order and worship. And of course, some of those same problems went uh, in, along in 1 Corinthians. So as we look at the day, the, the day's topic is basically on prayer. And so I think he, he wanted to instruct them in worship. What do you do about prayer? How does prayer rate? Um, there's a story about the, uh, the pastor was preaching and he saw this, this little, uh, this young person there uh, and he, he looked like he was praying but all service long kept saying Tokyo, 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 Tokyo. And I go, why in the world? So he went over and he said, um, are, are you praying for the people in Tokyo to come to the Lord? He says, no. He said, I had a test on Friday and I was asking God to make Tokyo the capital of China. <laughs> Now, there might be a lot of reasons why we pray, but uh, we want to wind up uh, praying the right way, and First uh, Timothy chapter 2 is going to talk about that a little bit, give us some instructions for it. As we look at it, um, I thought of a, 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 a movie I watched once that um, I, I'm not a big Jim Carrey fan. I think he's kind of rank us in some of the stuff, but I liked him in this particular film. It was an interesting application, and uh, I'm going to throw it today. Um, he takes over God's job. It's called Bruce Almighty. Anybody seen it? Okay. He thinks he's going to do God's job better than anybody else. And so uh, he takes on God's job, and uh, all of a sudden these prayer requests come, start coming in. So uh, it's kind of humorous, uh, but uh, when you hear him hearing voices in the beginning, if you don't know the context of the film, he's hearing all these prayers because now he's taken over God's job. So go ahead, Sean, if you would. Well, you took the job, Bruce, so I suggest you get to it. Prayers, prayers, okay, prayers. Uh, this creepy whisper thing has to end. Organization and management. That's what I need. I need a system, something concrete. Concentrate. Files. Let all prayers be organized into files. Well, that takes care of the voices. Not exactly a space saver, though. Grace might notice. Prayer post-its. Okay, I need something with a lock. Security combination, a password. A password. Yo! You've got prayer. Welcome to the Revelation Superhighway. We bless, no mess. Downloading now. <laughs> it's good. It's good. This is gonna take a while. One million five hundred twenty-seven thousand five hundred and three prayer requests. I better manifest some coffee. Hola! One bell dance! Bueno, 
días. Buenos días. Disfrute un buen café. Gracias, señor. Adiós. Adiós. Now that's fresh mountain-grown coffee from the hills of Colombia. Well, if you look at the field, uh, everybody's not happy uh, <laughs> because uh, yes isn't the proper answer for all requests. In fact, uh, Mrs. Graham, uh, Billy Graham's wife, once said, uh, if, I, if God had answered all my prayer requests with yes, I would have married the wrong guy five times. <laughs> uh, there's, there's three ways to answer. One is yes, one is no, and sometimes one is slow. You know, wait, not going to come right off. But we want to take a look at this prayer, that this idea of prayer today as we look at the beginning of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I'd like you to read it with me if you would. So let's all stand up as you would, and let's go through the first uh, eight verses of here and just uh, read them back and forth. And I think we have a pretty even uh, break, so I'm going to ask the uh, right side to do the first verses, the odd verses, and you're the even people today, okay? So read, th read through it with us, and uh, I'm going to read all the verses with you so that those that are listening on uh, tape uh, or on uh, the internet can hear us. Let's start off here with first, uh, first verse. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in th authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. You may be seated. As we take a look at this today, we're going to start off with the first two verses, which says, who should we pray for? And as you look at the first two verses, it says, um, I urge that entreaties, prayers, and petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all people. Now, these are four different words. I'm not going to go and exegete every single word, but let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, supplications or entreaties is requests. Things we're asking for. Um, have you ever asked God for anything? Okay. That is the most common form of prayer, unfortunately, uh, because sometimes there are other things. Uh, and uh, This is a bonus, not even my sermons, but you want to keep the word acts in your mind, A-C-T-S. Uh, a good um, outline for praying is A, C, confession, T, thanksgiving, and then S, Supplications, there's a request coming in. But supplications and trees is the first word to use. The second word is prayer. It's just a general word for praying to God, talking to Him, having conversation. The third word that he uses here is petitions, and um, really the word is intercessions. And the idea here, I believe, is interceding f uh, on behalf of other, for other people, you know, God to heal, healing or guidance or wisdom or something for others rather than oneself, which is supplications. And then lastly, thanksgiving. Uh, there's just too little thanks a lot of times. Uh, and, we can, and again, uh, we, could pr we could preach an entire sermon on this. I mean, you think of the lepers, you know, who they healed 10 lepers, and how many came back to say thanks? 
one, you know, and that guy was a Samaritan. So I mean, it's just it's just when you look at the when you when you look at Thanksgiving, um, do we do we stop and thank God for things? You know, or we just keep on going until we need something. Also, it's, it's a request. So there's four kinds of uh, Thanksgivings that he has here, and it's good for us to think about those things as we're looking at them. But the the I want to jump on to verse two here. I, I want to who. Uh, should we pray for? The first thing is pray for all men, okay? Pray for all men. In verse 2, it's, um, in verse 1, it says, the entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of, what's the, all men, okay? So don't leave anybody out. It's not like, I'm only going to pray for Christians. I'm only going to pray for people in America. I'm only going to pray for people, you know, in a country I love or my homeland. I'm not going to only pray for my friends or my family or for men or for women or for uh, whatever it is. We pray for all men. Uh, and this word all is going to come up consistently here because God's salvation is for all. And so as we think of all men, we need to pray for everyone, you know? Um, and this is maybe classes of people. Don't just pray for people that are neighbors, people that are friends. But, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things we can pray for. And I must admit, and I, I should give this disclaimer as I start, as I'm, as I'm reading this sermon and, and reading the things that we do and should be doing and so forth, I'm feeling guilty myself, you know, over, over the, the, the way in which we pray, you know, and how many times we pray and when do we pray and how, how um, uh, real are our prayers, you know. Uh, it just, it is, uh, it is, it is uh, convicting, <laughs> convicting not only as a pastor not only as a as a person but also as a church you know our times for prayer we have a we have prayer is one of our five uh core values and we and we talk about prayer we had a whole sunday of prayer but you know you have so many things you're doing in service and you know you don't have time for you, you don't put prayer into there now we used to say you know we'd have a silent prayer before uh the offering so you can pray for things on your heart but of course you can pray for those things at home too and you should be but it's, I mean, praise is a good part, you know, as we praise God. Giving is a good part as we have the gifts. Uh, learning the word, he said, come to the table. Well, you know, it says the, you know, the meat of the word is there. So we, we need to get the meat of the words. But there's, but we just, we need to involve prayer in our lives. And you can't pray for all men if the only time you're praying is during the offering time at church, okay? Uh, we need to look at how often we're praying. The Bible says pray without ceasing, you know? So always um, you know, one of the times I pray is when I can't go back to sleep. It seems like it, it's been 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, wake up and I'm, or 5 o'clock in the morning and I can't, I'm, I, I can't get back to sleep, so might as well use it for praying, you know, and prayer. Sometimes you can fall back to sleep, sometimes you know, that's hard to say, you know, pray to fall asleep, you know, but uh, use your time wisely. You're driving, you know. Um, pray for all men. Don't pray for just your friends, just your self-supplications. Pray for thanks. Thank you, God, for the church. Thank you, God, for your country. You know, there's all kinds of things. So we need to pray for on behalf of all men. In fact, in Matthew 4.44, it says, uh, excuse me, 5.44, it says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. Now, there's a, there's a thought. Who do we leave out when it says pray for all men? Nobody. And sometimes when we pray for our enemies, you know, prayer I don't think always changes God or circumstances, I think prayer changes us. As we pray for our enemies, sometimes God softens our heart towards them. Sometimes God allows us to see that they are having some struggles and some troubles themselves. And the reaction from them wasn't really intended the way it should have come off, but that they've got some real struggles and they need our prayers. Pray for all men. There was a lady uh, who, was, who was thinking, you know, boy, I should, I, should, I should be praying more, but I don't know what to pray. And this is years ago because we don't even have this. So I don't think it was much anymore. But, you know, we got, we got all kinds of lines, you know, that we, that we have in our, in our society. You know, the, as, we're, as we're thinking about it, we've got uh, bus lines, clothes lines, fishing lines, telephone lines. She says, why not a prayer line? And so she hung up a line over top of her ironing board. And she would put her prayer request on there. As she's ironing, which is kind of a monotonous job. How many ladies iron anymore? Anybody? <laughs> you know, everything's wash and wear. But, you know, she put a line there and she wrote her prayer request. Kind of like McDonald's, you know, you go there and they put the slips on what you're ordering, you know, on the thing. And she just prayed down the line. And, and people got to know that she was praying for stuff and they'd give her a prayer request and she'd put them on her line. Maybe you have a, a creative way of thinking of a way that you can continue to pray for all men. But think through it. Maybe it's a little book. 
Maybe it's, maybe it's your notepad on your you know, iPhone or whatever it is or your, or your Android. Or, um, how are we going to pray? And then secondly, pray for all leaders. It says in Romans 3, 1 to 7, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. So we says pray for kings and all in authority. We need to pray for people. We need to pray for those who are leaders, not only in our nation, but in other spots. Um, in Morrisville, I don't know if you know, that, our, but our school superintendent is a believer. Uh, he needs to have prayer. And even if he wasn't a believer, he still needs prayer. There's teachers, there's police officers, there's uh, military, uh, there's your boss at work. Pray for all men, but especially those who are in authority. Sometimes we have problems. Anybody ever have a problem at work with a boss? Okay, for us five, <laughs> some of me a couple times, you know. Pray for your boss. Maybe, the, maybe God will bring him to have some issue. Maybe things will get better for him. Maybe you can be a witness. You know, if you have problems with your boss and are not a believer, <laughs> at least you know you got an opportunity to witness for God and do something good, right? Now, I'm, I'm not going to try to get in trouble over the next few slides, but stick with me, okay? Next slide, Sean. <laughs> uh, some people don't like our current president. They've compared him to Hitler. Now, I know we're in a split congregation, and we always are, but Democrats and Republicans. People have to say horrible things, and I don't think we should ever say horrible things about anybody in authority, even if you hate them or don't like them. But this is what's going on some of the times. Let me go to the next slide and just show you something. Anybody here have ne ever hear of Nero? Okay. He burned down Rome. Now, there's not proof of that. I mean, most people think that he burned down Rome. Um, I did not personally sent somebody, asked some people out to do it. And then what did he do? Because he wanted to rebuild Rome. And he blamed the Christians for it. And that's one of his opportunities for persecuting the Christians. And in fact, Nero was the one that eventually beheaded Paul. So as we think of this, Nero was emperor during Paul's day. So regardless of what you think of the president, even if you don't like the president, maybe you love the president. Either way, maybe you love his policies but don't care for him particularly. It doesn't matter. In Paul's day, when he's giving this command to pray for kings and those in authority, Nero is the emperor. Nero who is persecuting Christians. An evil dictator. Look at the next slide. My bet is that if you voted for one of these guys, you did not vote for the other. I'm not going to ask for a poll here, but I'm just betting that you voted for one of the other these guys, but probably not for both. Uh, if you did vote for both, you can let me know. I, some of you may not vote for either one. But the Bible says that we pray for those in authority, whether you agree with them or disagree with them. Some of us were very supportive of President Obama, and some of us hated his policies. And yet we still need to pray for him. Some of us love the policies of the current president, and some of us hate the current policies of the president. You still need to pray for him. And what do we pray for? Well, as you, as you read it, as you, as you look in this thing, uh, in, in this particular section, and, and looks at what we should pray for, we pray for guidance for these presidents. Pray for right decisions. I prayed that for both of these presidents. Sometimes I was happy, and sometimes I was very unhappy. But that doesn't mean we pray. God can use anybody. I've had some people talk about, and it wasn't about the president, but just other things that said, you know, who can God use? Well, in the Old Testament, God used a donkey to talk to Balaam. <laughs> you know? The person that God uses in your life, whether it's a boss or whether it's someone else, does not have to be a perfect person. It doesn't have to be a good person. But they can still do God's work. And so we need to pray for them. We're in a big controversy right now, and, and, and it will always be a controversy. Let's face it. <laughs> it, it'll always be on the Supreme Court. We're always going to, or some people will never vote for him if it was God, you know? They wouldn't vote. And yet, the Supreme Court is so important. Next slide, Sean, if you would. One of the things that's critical in the Supreme Court, in my estimation, is religious freedom. Religious freedom. I'll be honest, I wonder where we're going to be in 50 or 100 years. I will be gone in 50 years, maybe gone in 30 years could be gone in one year. But I wonder where the United States is going in the future. And the Supreme Court is critical. This person here, um, because of the uh, propensity for where our society is going, refused to make a wedding cake 
for a homosexual couple. Or again, I, I don't think they were lesbian. I, think, I don't think they were lesbian. I think it was a homosexual couple. Said, I do not feel you can buy anything you want at the store. I'll send you to another baker. I've got friends who will bake, gladly bake you cake. But I cannot personally do this because of the expression of my, of, 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 and the, as it came across the Supreme Court, expression of art. And I cannot paint stuff and do stuff that is against my religion. And the day that the Supreme Court accepted that case, a lawyer in Colorado called him and asked him to make a cake for a transgender person who was going from being a man to a woman or a woman to a man, I don't know. The day the Supreme Court, before the decision was even made, Colorado sat on that decision. The Supreme Court gave their decision. It's kind of like holding their back pocket. The Supreme Court gave that decision and said, no, religious freedom trumps, in his life, trumps the requirement that he do something against his convictions. They waited until after the Supreme Court made that decision, and then Colorado has again a second time going after, going after this person. The first time for not making a wedding cake, the second time for not making a transgender cake. I don't know who makes cakes for transgender things, but they were looking to pick a fight, and it will not get easier. It will not get easier. Right now, pastors don't have to tr do pa weddings for, so for, for couples or for people, anybody that I don't think they're ready for. It's my decision. Again, I'm not trying to get political, but it scared me to death when the FBI raided a lawyer's office to get the president's files because I thought lawyers had confidentiality. I thought doctors had confidentiality. I thought pastors have confidentiality. When will be the day when the Supreme Court says this pastor no longer has confidentiality? And we're going to ask you to do something. In Houston, the, and they, again, it didn't, it didn't go real far, but in Houston, I understand, at one point in time, they required all the pastors to turn in all their sermons. They, wanted to get, they were trying to get all the pastors to turn their sermons in so they could see if they said anything about homosexuals. There was, a, there was a chaplain who I know of who was reprimanded by a captain in the Navy who's an 06 in the Army to be a colonel reprimanded because of a private counseling session and the discussion he had with a, it was a homosexual, a discussion he had with what the Bible taught and, and how he could do it. Now, I've, I've talked to people like that. And I'll tell people in, when, I, when I counsel them in the military, I said, I got two, two, two tool chests and I deal with unbelievers all the time. I said, I can counsel you on anything in your life and I can talk to you about it. I said, I've got hammers and saws and all kinds of stuff, but in this tool chest over here, I've got my power saws. And that's the scriptures. That's the Bible. I said, if you don't, if you're an atheist, and I dealt with many of them, I had a person come to me and said, I'm a Wiccan. The biggest compliment they could give me was after our discussion, they said, you're the first chaplain or Christian that's really talked to me about this. He was impressed that I didn't just, you know, lamb blast him for something. Now, I'm not saying, that, I'm, I'm saying that I, I talked with them in a credible way, but I didn't look down on him when I talked to him. So I would say, they came in, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that, you know, religious crap. That's fine. You have a problem with your marriage? I got lots of stuff I can help you with. How are you doing this? But you know, if you want me to reach into my, 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 power, my power toolbox, I've got some other stuff I can help. But they don't want that. They will come to the place, and they did this with this, soul, this with Navy uh, personnel, and I think the Navy's some recording, so I'm going to be in trouble here, but I think the Navy's worse than the Army on this stuff. The Army's been very supportive so far. Uh, the Air Force has also had its problems with Weinstein. But it's very supportive so far. But they tried to, they tried to get rid of this chap. This chaplain wound up uh, appealing the decision, and they wound up giving that, that Navy captain a reprimand, a little reprimand. But the, the sad part is the chaplain's out of the ministry. He's out of the, he's out of the chaplaincy. I don't know what happened, but whether he quit or whether he retired or whatever, but he's gone. This will continue to happen. And we need officials and leaders in our nation who will continue to protect the rights. Why did we start America? Freedom of religion. They were trying in England to tell those who were, those who were congregationalists, basically. It was Presbyterians and, and Baptists who were congregationalists. And they said, we want you to use the official prayer book of the Anglican Church. And if not, you're done. 
and other stuff. Many of those went to Holland. The Baptists, a number of them, they didn't come to America. They went back to England for the most part. Eventually, they did come to America. And in Holland, the pilgrims, who were congregationalists, came to America. Of course, they did make the same mistake in Massachusetts, if you read the history. They tried to set up a religious autocracy there, and the Baptists, who eventually came here, wound up in jail in, in Massachusetts, which is why they created Rhode Island, which was total religious freedom. If you go to Newport, which, is, which was founded by the Baptists, uh, and uh, White was the Baptist pastor there, and he was also the mayor of the town. He's the one that secured the, the, um, um, the documents in order to make Rhode Island a state, or the charter for Rhode Island. Uh, you have the largest uh, Quaker meeting house there, the second oldest synagogue there, because religious freedom. But it will be, be gone. So when I say here, pray for those in authority, I mean that we need to do that. Jesus prayed for the ones who were crucifying. Stephen said, let not the sin be held over. Stephen, while he's being stoned, prayed for his enemies. We need to pray for all men, and we need to make our prayers fervent because someday we, not, we may not be able to sit in a church like this and praise God. We may wind up going to house churches and going underground, and that's okay. Maybe the church will flourish better. But that doesn't mean we're relieved of the responsibility of praying for those who are in authority over us, whether it's the president, the Supreme Court, the Congress, the Senate, the uh, local officials, your town mayor, your town council, which Eileen's one of those members, we need to pray for them. The next, second part here is what do we pray for? Verses 3 and 4. In verse um, 3 it says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, for who desires all men, again, we hear that? All men, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. So who are we praying for? I think it's since he's saying, pray to God because he wants all men to be saved. I think we need to pray for those who are unbelievers. You need to be praying for your friends who don't know Jesus Christ. One of my big concerns here in our church is that sometimes I think um, we don't have a real concern for the unbeliever. And I'll tell you why. It's a personal thing. We have a, we have a day that well, we just had it recently where we in, invite your friends, you know, to the church. Back to church Sunday. And I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand. How many of you actually invited a friend to come with you? Now, they may have not shown up. That's our responsibilities on whether they show up. But how many of you actually invited a friend to church? I know of a couple. I know that some that came. But to my knowledge, we had four visitors that day. Now, maybe all of you asked, and they all said no, and there's a lot of people that I've asked that, that, that say no to me. But if we can't even ask them to church, how are we going to pray for people to come to saved? It says pray for all men. We're not going to win Morrisville to Jesus Christ or the area to Jesus Christ where you live if you never ask anybody to church, if you never witness to them. That's what Take Your Bible to Church Today is about. Let the people in your school, or take, excuse me, take your Bible to school day. That's to let the people in the school know, I'm a believer. Start up some conversations with them. People will not come to Christ unless we pray for them and we ask them. This is convicting. We come to church every Sunday. We enjoy it. Sometimes we criticize the preacher or the music team. Sometimes we pat the preacher on the back or we pat the music team on the back. But who else knows it? One of my, that's why we are in the, the fairgrounds down here whenever they're having an outdoor event. That's why we put floats in the parade because people aren't standing out here saying, oh, that's a good worship team. They can go on the internet, but how many people in Mars will go on the internet to listen to our service to see how good we are? They can't see outside our walls. You know how they see outside our walls? Say it. You. Say the word me. How do they see outside our walls? That's what they see. Pray for all men. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 2 Peter verses 3 and 9 says, God has given a thousand days as one year. One, year is a th one day is a thousand years. He says, Because he is, pa he is being patient, because he is not willing that any should perish. Why doesn't he come back today? Because maybe your friend or your friend or your neighbor or your coworker needs Jesus Christ. And he's waiting one more day to see if you'll get the courage to go out and say, will you come to Jesus Christ? When the final day comes, will the neighbors on your street 
say, I never heard of a church. I didn't know about Jesus Christ. I never got a brochure. Some of the people, I went up and down my street that day. And, I, and frankly, the reason I did it was because I realized it, if I had been one of you, maybe I would have done it. But the, boy, the pastor can't do this. Nobody can, you know? I took 35 of those brochures. I went up the entire street, down my street, went over to the next street, and I gave out the brochures. I knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm your neighbor four floors down. That's why I asked you who that neighbor was because I was trying to figure out their name when I stopped by to see them. And if they weren't there, I left the brochure on their, on their door. Two people came. <laughs> None of the people that I went door to door to. Two, two other people came. Uh, but you know what? They're there. When, when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, they'll never be able to say, nobody invited me to church. I didn't even know there was a church in the community that loved Jesus Christ. They'll stand, at least they got something. But it probably wasn't enough. At Easter and Christmas, we try to make some, and my wife does it. I'm not the baker. She makes some stuff. And, we, and Josh and I go around and we deliver it to our neighbors with a little track in it or a church brochure. We don't have enough for everybody, but we take the for eight or ten people that are 12 that are closest to us. Pray for all men. Pray for, and pray because God doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants them saved. That's what we need to pray for. And then he says, pray for the knowledge of the truth. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, in whose case, talking about the unbeliever, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel or of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. First, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 to 15 says, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. People think he's a great thing. First Peter 5, 8, your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking someone to devour. The devil blinds their minds so our prayer should be that they have a knowledge of the truth. They come to understand. You may talk to them and they say they don't understand at all. But that's okay. At least give them the gospel. Are you able to talk to somebody, to a neighbor, to a friend, to someone that's at your work about Jesus Christ intelligently? You don't need to know all the scriptures. Just tell them your own experience, how you love Jesus and the difference he's made in your life. Tell them how it's giving you comfort when someone has died that you know is a believer and is in heaven. Tell them how when you have a problem with your boss, you pray about it, and God gives you strength to get through the day even though you hate the guy. Make sure it's not a coworker. You don't want him to know that. But <laughs> What to pray for. Then verse 3, or not for, verses 5 and 6, 3, who to pray through. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It actually starts off, there's one God, and then there's one mediator between the man and God and the man Christ Jesus. Why Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ was both fully God and fully man. In Job chapter 9, verse 33, Job is complaining because he's everything taken. He says, God, give me an umpire that can stand between you and me, one who who's also knows you but also knows me. Jesus Christ was the answer to Job's prayer in chapter 9, verse 33. One God and one mediator. Uh, Shall we go ahead and play that in the second video, please? It's a one minute video. Um, not everybody holds to this. I'm not trying to put down another faith, but I just want you to understand if you've not had contact, what some other faiths feel about this. I'm going to read this to you because it doesn't have the words on it. The words are appearing and maybe you can't see them. Uh, maybe you can't understand them, but um, this is another, another faith group. It says, Uncline unto my aid, O Lord. Lord, make me make haste to help me. Glory be to the Father and the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise God. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known to any man who fled to, to thy protection, implored thy help, and sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto thee, the Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee I come, before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O mother and of the Lord and heart, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer me. We fly to your people, and the Holy Mother of God, despise not our petitions and our necessities, but deliver us always from all dangers of glorious and blessed virgin. You can stop that uh, there. I, I just, just a sample. 
the scriptures in this place say there's one God and one mediator. And he goes even further in that. He says here, not only one God and one mediator, but it says in verse 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at all time. The two things that stand out with Jesus Christ is that he is a mediator. He is both God and man. He's, he, he, he is God himself, but he's also lived here, so he, he has stretched both. He is the, and then in the second point, there is a one ransom. He is the only one who was paid a ransom or who could pay a ransom. It's not a Buddha. It's not Confucius. You know, it's not uh, Muhammad. It's nobody else. It's Jesus Christ. He is the one who is both God and man and can span that gulf, as Job said, and he's the one who has paid a ransom. So God said, your sins offend me, and Jesus Christ, who is perfect and a man, he paid the penalty. There is no other mediator. Whatever faith the group it is, there's only one mediator between God and man. It says one God, and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And here's the one. Oftentimes the scripture says, we pray in the name of Jesus. Oftentimes, and we, and we just say it by rope, but it has meaning, you know? In Jesus' name, amen. Why? Because we don't have any right to approach God except through Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. Winston Churchill once, once said, never was so much owed by so many to so few after the Battle of Britain. I could change a couple words in that. So never was so much owed by so many to only one. Lastly, verse 8. Verse 7 just talks about Jesus, about Paul being a preacher and one who proclaims this message, and all of us should be the same. All of us should be those who proclaim the message. Verse 8. Men should pray in every place. How to pray. Men should pray in every place. We should pray for all men. If Christ died for all men, then we should pray for all men. Uh, late night, uh, there, was a, there was a salesman who was dry, riding through in uh, town, and he got to a place, and there was no place in this hotel. There was one man who was going up to his room and said, well, I got two beds in my room. If you'd like to come with me, you can, you know, share the other bed. The man walked up with him. I'm going to refer to my notes to make sure I get it right. Just before retiring, the man who had shown such hospitality knelt and prayed aloud. In his petition, he referred to the stranger by name and asked the Lord to bless him. Upon awakening the next day, he told his guest it was his habit to read the Bible and commune with God at the beginning of each day and asked if he would like to join him. The Holy Spirit had been speaking to the heart of the salesman, and when his host tactfully confronted him with the claims of Christ, he gladly received the Savior. As the two were ready to depart, they exchanged business cards. The new believer was amazed to read on the other person's business card. Guess? William Jennings Bryan, Secretary of State. <laughs> I admire that man so much. He was the one that was made of, that the world tried to make a fool of at the Scopes Monkey Trials, they call it, because he was the one who tried to retain the fact that evolution would not be taught in our schools and that the creation would be. And today we're still fighting that battle because it wanted nothing to do with creation. That was 1925 that that took place. William Jennings, I admired him so much. He, was, he ran for president three times. Actually, I think, lost, won the popular vote and lost the Electoral College for one of those. When McKinley took us into the First World War, he was a Secretary of State. If I, I haven't read this recently, but to my knowledge, he quit his job as Secretary of State because he disagreed with that. He d thought McKinley's actions would take us into war. And then, when McKinley did take us into war, he went and tried to sign up in the military because he supported his nation. Uh, the man was a, a, a believer to the nth degree. William Jennings Bryan College is named after him down south. William Carey was once reproached because he spent too much time in prayer. He said, you're, you're not spending enough time? You're, you're a cobbler. You should be doing cobbling shoes. He says, cobbling shoes is how I, put my, is how I pay the bills. Prayer is my ministry. It is something we need to be doing. And here it says, men should be praying, lifting up holy hands. Men, we need to step up. We need to step up. Sometimes we have a prayer meeting or have a, a time and we ask, who's going to pray? <laughs> Sometimes it's the women that pray. Men don't pray. Maybe you don't pray in public because you don't pray in private or you don't pray at home. He's talking in this chapter 2 about worship. And men need to pray. Men need to be the leaders in the church. 
Men need to be able to pray out loud and say, God means something to me. And if you can't do it in your private life, if you can't do it at home, you can't do it in church, how are you going to do it to the unbeliever? We have life groups. Are you men praying? Are you even attending the life groups? You should be taking your, your families and taking them to a life group, and you should be praying in front of them. Prayer is our business. And it says men should be examples in the body of Christ by holding up holy hands and praying. And there's many different postures throughout the Bible. On, on the next place here, we have them. There's standing, there's hand spread, there's bowing your head, there's lifting your eyes towards heaven, there's kneeling, there's falling down, prostrate. There's all kinds of ways to pray, but yet we need to pray. And men, you and I need to pray. It can't, we can't be bashful about it. Do you talk at work? Do you talk to people at work? Do you talk to your friends? Do you talk to your neighbors? Talk to God. It's the same thing. Nobody's down there examining, do you know your prayer or, or how flowery it is? It's having a conversation with God about all men. A little girl went to bed one night and she threw her shoe under the bed. It happened for about five nights in a row. Finally, the mom said, do I, uh, Susie, whatever her name was, why are you throwing your shoe under the bed? She says, well, because then when I, in the morning, when I have to put my shoes on, I have to get on my knees under my bed to find it and it reminds me to pray. Maybe all of us should be throwing our shoes under our bed. Seven days without prayer makes one week. Seven days without prayer makes one week. Pray to God for all people through our one mediator, Jesus Christ. Pray to God for all people through our one mediator, Jesus Christ. I'm going to read to you a, a section of Scripture, and then I'm going to ask our two, elder, two pastors, other pastors, to come up and give a brief prayer as we end this. I think that's appropriate. And I'm going to ask the guys to come up and raise their hands. Come on, guys, if you would, please bring that microphone over here so you can uh, do that. Let's all read. Let me just read this section for you if you go to the next slide. It's from Psalm 86. It says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and, hear, and answer me, for I am afflicted and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and give heed to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I cry upon thee, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will glorify you your name forever. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we come before you as completely unworthy on our own selves in ourselves. We are only worthy through the blood of Christ. So we acknowledge that. We thank you for that blood. We thank you for his sacrifice for us. We thank you for the privilege, the honor, the glory of prayer. And uh, we know, I know that uh, when we get to heaven, we're going to look down and back and, and say, oh, if only I'd have spent more time in prayer. I can't believe that I spent so little time. But this morning we spend this time acknowledging that prayer is our business. Prayer is our way to uh, fellowship with you on a regular, daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And we lift up our hands to do so this morning. And we thank you for that glorious privilege. In Jesus' name. Father, as we continue in prayer, we do lift up holy hands to heaven, to you, to the throne of mercy and grace, Lord. 
We bow our knee before you and we pray, Lord, that we are not only leaders of, of prayer too, Lord, but also as that flows through us, through the Spirit of God, that other people will come before you on their knees or wherever they may be with have an attitude of prayer. Father, forgive us too because we do know that prayer is hard work, but yet you prayed in every circumstances that you went into. You've always prayed first, Lord. So, Father, help that instill us into our minds and into our hearts. Father, we do thank you that we are the children of God and that you are our leader, Lord, that you are our Savior, that you are our Redeemer, that you are forgiver, that you are our hope, Lord, because you are our living hope, because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen.